belonging again two is the address of the explanation of belonging again one. And belonging again one is going to talk about sort of like why is it that people, you know, people talk about the meaning crisis. They talk about the meta crisis. They talk about collapsing birth rates. They talk about the loss of friendship, the loss of relationship. Well, why, why exactly is that? And why are these things happening? And, you know, I, I really like a lot of the sociologists like a Peter Berger, a Philip Brief and different people like that. And so the first book was trying to explain basically a way to sum it up is that we've lost givens. Like reality is no longer given to us, um, which in one way is outstanding. We're liberated. We're free to do whatever we want, to think however we want. But the problem is uh, wherever there's choice, it's existential. It's difficult to decide and it's overwhelming and it's anxiety. So freedom creates anxiety. But of course, that means you can escape anxiety via oppression or being controlled or other problematic things like that. Well, that's not good. But then that would mean that you have to learn to be able to handle the loss of givens uh, in that anxiety space. Well, how in the world do you do that? What does that even mean? And how do you begin to work to a place where you can come to terms with that loss of givenness? Um, that's, uh, that's what the address is about. And one of the things that I've been, just been very interested in recently is how exactly the material world around us becomes married with an abstraction according to which it is intelligible to us. So a, a, a form of this, for example, would be, I say that bookshelf right there is worth $200. Well, where is $200 located in facticity? Where do you find $200, right? And yet $200 still is a kind of concrete reality. It's abstract and yet it's also concrete. That's what's weird. It's, um, you know, um, like someone like Marx will call it a fetish. He'll call it like it's a religion. It's like metaphysics. And yet it's also not purely abstract. So the bookcase right there is worth $200 or whatever it is. I'm just making up a number. And it would seem erroneous to say it's an illusion to be worth $200. That seems like an, that seems wrong to say that's an illusion. But it also seems wrong to say that $200 is a fact the same way that this is hard or that this is a fact, right? So what is this middle space according to which society makes metaphysical dimensions intelligible? What are those? And how do you make new ones? Because that's what it all comes down to. Because the thing is, if I say, you know, if, I'm, if, if you're really asking the question, how do you get the majority of people to believe that that bookcase is worth $200 and that $200 is an abstraction that has an authority? It's kind of like, pretty wild that people come to believe that and to organize their life around that. And in a way that's oppressive because then everyone's living kind of according to a almost myth that this bookshelf is worth $200. And yet that also allows social intelligibility. I can now talk to people about that bookcase as being worth $200. And even whether they're Chinese, American, Catholic, Hindu, it doesn't matter. There's a kind of universal language in that, uh, that, in that abstract form, right? So if we want to talk about community, global community, global pluralism, we're going to have to somehow create a new abstract uh, social form like that. That isn't just money. Because the problem is, you could argue that a big cause of the meaning crisis is that the only global language is money, right? Because money is a kind of language. And now, and everyone feels kind of reduced by that. They feel reductionist or the other global language we try to, to create was science. Glo you know, you use facts because those are, you know, uh, e equals MC squared, whether you're Hindu, Christian, you know, man, woman, it doesn't matter, right? Glo you know, scientific laws are also a universal language. Money and scientific laws, and I'll just stop on those two, are forms of a universal language that mod modernity generated to help us deal with problems of difference. But as we see, those lead to what? what Viveki calls the meaning crisis. So basically, if we're going to avoid the meaning crisis and not end up in everyone just not talking to one another because we don't have a shared language and atomizing, we have to somehow think about a new abstract social form that is not reductionist, that allows people from different pluralistic backgrounds to relate to one another without reducing one another. But then at the same time, how do you even do that? What does it mean to have a universal language that is non-reductionist, that is intelligible to all people of all difference, 
so that the globe doesn't end up in, oh, World War III or tribalism or everyone, you know, Duganism, all of these different things pulling apart. Some candidates that come to mind are things like friendship, beauty. Beauty is an abstract social form that can be understood across difference. Lack, the apathetic center we were speaking with Guy about. So I've been thinking a lot about that particular problem on a new global abstract form that has a certain authority over people that, that makes difference intelligible, without which global pluralism seems impossible, at least not in a form that doesn't lead to everyone retreating or alienation or various forms like that. So as I go through the chaos of belonging again to, this is kind of, you could say, kind of the central consideration. Because again, if we got we got to kind of respect modernism in the sense that it found a universal language, facticity, science, money, it's just that there were unintended consequences of that. And now we're facing those unintended consequences. So we have to do something else, but then also keep our eye on the ball of what that something else looks like. And it's some abstract social form that is able to be a kind of universal language. But I give it back to you.